Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're from. This is Marilyn Trader. I am your Southeast Regional Representative for the Helen Keller National Center. We are so excited to have you here today. I know I've got Christmas music on in the background. We need as much happiness as possible around here, right? And so today you are going to be full of happiness as we are so excited to continue with our Southeast webinar sessions. Uh, this collaborative has been brought to you by our Southeast DefLine projects. Without further ado, we're so excited to have our legendary David Brown. So David, I'm going to go off the screen. Good luck. Have fun. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, you don't really need to see me. I've been, um, I have a demented dog, literally, and he's had me up since four o'clock this morning. So I'm feeling, although I've shaved and showered, I'm feeling a bit rough. Um, it's great to be back with uh, the Southeast DeafBlind State Projects. Um, I've visited them uh, on a number of occasions, um, and I see Michelle from uh, Florida is also here in the audience. I've been to Florida several times. I have the warmest memories of coming down to the South, even though um, some years ago, I didn't quite know where the South was because I'm uh, British. Um, it's really good to be back. I'm hoping that this session will be helpful to you. It's a bit of a self-indulgence because I'm always asked to do the same things over and over again. Um, a set observational assessment, charge syndrome, uh, the multi-sensory impairment, uh, the forgotten senses of proprioception and vestibular. And I really wanted to change something different. So I've come up with this. And it turned out to be a little unmanageable. I ended up with enough material for like five hours. And I've had to cut it down and then I've put some back, you know, my usual style. So I hope it makes sense. I'm going to go fairly quickly. And right at the beginning, uh, I want to give you uh, these three links. They're all to the National Centre on Deaf Blindness, NCDB, which is the biggest uh, collection of information about deaf blindness in the world, in any language. And um, I've picked out three, three things from there. There's an awful lot else. But if my session arouses your interest, or if, if some of it confuses you and you want to clarify, um, if you go to the, the first link, an overview of deaf blindness will fill in a lot of the gaps that I in inevitably will be having to leave today. Then the next link is to the section on educational practices, which will get you to the heart of the deaf blind philosophy of education. And then the bottom, it says um, products, modules, OHOA, O-H-O-A. And that stands for open hands, open access, which is actually a very, very comprehensive training module that was created to train interveners, uh, the people who work one-on-one -on -one with students with deaf blindness. Though I have to say, uh, there may be as many teachers using that training as there are interveners. And I myself go to it. I wrote, I helped to write one of the modules, but there are lots of modules. And I occasionally go there to dig out information and to get ideas uh, for myself. And if you go to the NCDB website, you will find answers to many, many of the questions you have relating to students with deaf blindness. And then since my focus is very much the educational approach and the educational philosophy, I, I often talk about the key, you know, if you can do all these things, you're fine and you're gonna be very successful at educating the child. Every one of these imperatives, you can almost shout them like orders, follow the child, know the child, individualize, do with, not for create conversations, use a multi-sensory perspective in your, in your assessment and your teaching. 
Each of those statements, of course, is a huge item. Uh, just follow the child. How you do that, why you do that, when you do that, it takes a long time to master. And I'm lucky because when I came into the deafblind field 37 years ago, uh, I met Jan van Dyck, the great Dutch teacher who gave us the philosophy of follow the child um, a long time ago. But it, it took me a while to realize what that meant in practice and why it was so important to get it right. And I have a quote here from, from Van Dyck. Um, this is the first time in the literature he ever talked about follow the child. It was in England in 1966. And he said, in the educational atmosphere I describe, the child holds the central position, the teacher follows the child, and when the child responds, the teacher is present to answer the child's request. And he, he doesn't mean literally follow the child unless they're very mobile, in which case you would follow them. But he means read the child carefully, read how they're feeling, read what they're interested in, read what they're trying to do or attempting to do and join in with it. You go and meet the child where they are rather than expecting the child to come and meet you where you are, which is a far more traditional approach to education. And indeed, when I was a schoolboy, I was expected to come where the teachers were um, and, and learn. So follow the child. Um, I'll say more about it as we go, but that is a key concept. And if you don't follow the child, you're never going to know the child. The two, the one follows from the other, absolutely. And it's only once you start to know the child, you're in a position to get your educational input appropriate and successful. And that means being very alert and very observant. And then individualize. And that might be what characterizes deafblind education more than anything else. It's an intensely individualized approach because even within the population that we label deafblind, there are enormous um, varieties of uh, ability and disability. And everything is going to have to be tweaked to make it right for that individual student. And you can't do that if you haven't first followed the child and learned who they are and got to know them. Do with, not for, is should be a key in every educational program because this is education. This is not looking after children. This is not taking care of their every wish and whim so they have no needs uh, they never have to put any effort into getting anything they want because somebody is providing for them. Then create conversations. And we're back to Van Dyke. He taught us that every interaction we have with the child should be in the form of a conversation, whether we're showing them things, touching them, speaking, signing, giving them objects, taking them somewhere helping them up a staircase, helping them go through a door. All those things, we should in our minds see them as conversations. So there's the opportunity for the child to respond to our input. And our input very often would be triggered by the child, of course. We would be responding to them. But where we initiate an input to the child, we should be ready for their reply. Their, their response. And lastly, multi-sensory perspective. We say deaf blind, but this is not only about eyes and ears. And I've made, almost made a career out of talking about all our sensory systems and why we need to know about them and understand them and observe to see how they're working or, or not working.
So there in a nutshell is, is deafblind education. And I will try now to fill in some of those gaps. And I, <laughs> I want to begin with four propositions. This is where I get, you know, professorial and a bit critical of, of the world. Deafblindness involves some of the most complex conditions we know and the unique combination of true multisensory impairment with multiple other anomalies, some of them potentially life-threatening, can lead to variability in functioning and periods when the child may be unavailable for attending and learning. And those things are probably built into the situation and may be inescapable and have to be allowed for and have to be worked around or worked on. Proposition two, that the right school and the right educational program for each child with deaf blindness never already exists, but must be created. The program must be fitted to the child, not the child to the program. And this is a big source of, of contention when children are first being placed in, in an educational program. Uh, and we often hear the phrase coming back from a school, oh, we don't do that, or we don't do that kind of thing here, or we can't do that here. Um, and I think we need to, to, to make it very clear to people that this is about individualization. So by definition, the right program for this individual child can't already exist. There will be places that are more favorable, more amenable, where there's a greater chance of success at creating the, 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 an appropriate program, but it won't exist. Or there has to be work and energy and discussion and teamwork to get the program right for the child. Proposition three, a successful and appropriate educational program begins and depends upon skilled assessment, which is flexible, ongoing and sensitive. All children with deaf blindness can be assessed successfully, provided the people doing the assessment know what they are doing. And there's the rub. Uh, deaf blind expertise is rare. The numbers of children have gone up and up over time, as I will discuss in a moment. Uh, and it's difficult sometimes to find people who genuinely can assess these children successfully. And that's where um, we have to think about uh, ongoing training and education of professionals. And Proposition 4 leads from that, that anyone responsible for designing and delivering a child's educational program needs some familiarity with deafblindness, which is kept up to date. With the increasing amount of information about deafblindness now available on the internet, this is perfectly feasible. And that's why I began with a couple of links to the National Center on Deafblindness. Um, there is so much information now, and increasingly, there is far more recorded uh, training material like this very webinar that I'm delivering at the moment. I've given, I think this is about the 14th webinar I've given this year. Almost all of them have been recorded and are posted on various websites or on YouTube. And many of my colleagues in the field are doing the same. Uh, Donna Carpenter uh, from, from Kentucky, who set this up, she gave us in California a wonderful webinar a month or so back. And I sat here on Saturday morning, fascinated and scribbling notes and just thinking, yes, yes, we, we all need to learn. We all need to be open to learning. Um, and there really isn't an excuse now. You don't have to go to some library somewhere. You don't have to pay somebody to photocopy articles and mail them to you. It's laid out for you online. And if you can't find stuff, there are people who can help you. So 
to move on to the history part. Um, the recorded history, there's evidence of deafblind people in, in the historical literature from long, long ago, um, particularly in Europe, and interestingly enough, in Japan, so I'm told. But the real literature on deafblindness begins in the United States with these two ladies, and many of you will be very familiar with them, Laura Bridgman and later on Helen Keller, and she, of course, became world famous. Laura was older. Uh, Laura was developing normally, and at the age of two, she got scarlet fever, and she had two older sisters who died with of the infection. She survived, but she was left completely blind, profoundly deaf, and with no sense of smell uh, or taste. And Samuel Gridley Howe was the teacher, a uh, very charismatic teacher, who uh, began to educate her and then took her to Perkins School for the Blind, just outside Boston, which became probably the, the El Dorado or the Valhalla of deafblind education, in certainly in the English-speaking world, and continues to be a centre of, of uh, very special expertise. And then um, much, much later, Helen Keller was born. She also was developing normally at birth, and she got an illness that we think was probably scarlet fever or meningitis, we don't know, when she was 19 months old, which left her deaf blind. And again, it was Perkins School that undertook her education. The important thing about these two women is they were born with full vision and hearing. And by the age of two, and even by the age of 19 months, a normally developing infant has acquired a lot of understanding of the world, how the world works, what things are, what they look like, what they sound like, what walking looks like, how you can learn to move your body in able to get to something that you can see. So they were very different to the majority of children today with deaf blindness who have congenital deaf blindness. Um, and I don't want to denigrate them or their teachers, but it was a very different task educating them. And it really largely boiled down to finding a way to deliver language to them, the English language to them, and give them a way to express with the English language, where we're facing a much broader, bigger task with the problem with the population of children with congenital deaf blindness. So although they were important, um, and uh, it's certainly in the case of Helen Keller, a major, major inspiration still to people all around the world. Um, I was reading a book about a, an opera singer at, at the weekend, and uh, she, she has a photograph. She was singing at the Metropolitan Opera in the 1950s, and Helen Keller came to see her in the dressing room. And there's a photo in her bio, the, the singer's biography. And she says it was one of the greatest moments in her life. Um, so the, these two women were pioneers, along with uh, Dr. Howe, of course. But really, the, the field of deafblind education as we know it lifted off in the 1960s, certainly in... in um, the United States, in Australia, and in um, Europe. And that was because of uh, rubella. And I don't know if you're familiar with rubella. Rubella is a virus, and it's a, when I was a child, we called it German measles. And I don't know why we called it German measles. It's not measles. It's a different virus. And the, prob the big problem with rubella is if you catch it, that you might not even know you have it, or your illness might be very mild. But if you're a woman and you're in the first three months of pregnancy, the rubella virus can do terrible, terrible damage to the fetus, uh, including to the eyes and the ears, uh, the heart 
and, and the brain. And in 19, I had to make a note of this, 64 to 65, there was a huge rubella epidemic, a pandemic, uh, which we're, of course, we're very familiar with that word these days. And as a result of the pandemic, uh, nine months later, well, less than nine months later, a large number of children were born with congenital rubella syndrome, and they were deaf blind. And we think in the US there were about 5,000 children born. I read somewhere that in, in my country, in the UK, uh, it was something like uh, 450 children. And other countries experienced the same thing. And nobody knew what to do with these children. So the federal government here in the US decided to put money in to providing regional deafblind centers. Uh, and I know on the West Coast, where I am, the states on the West Coast, their regional center was, I believe, was in Denver, Colorado. And those regional centers were centers of expertise. They were uh, providers of information by telephone or by copying information and literally mailing it. And in those days, copying was largely done on a machine where you turned a handle. Uh, it wasn't photocopying necessarily. Um, they also provided some level of training and they had some outreach staff who could travel to the states in their area. And at some point, and I can't, I can't now remember when, it was decided to increase the grant, the federal grant, but give money to every individual state to create a, a statewide deafblind project. And that structure has uh, carried through to the present day. And of course, it's the state deafblind projects in several of the Southeast states who are putting this series of webinars on. I'm only in the United States because I got a job with the California State Deafblind Project. And uh, the, I, I urge you to look up and contact your deafblind project if you need help or information. Um, we are all wonderful people. We're very open. Um, we can be very helpful. And um, if we don't know things, we have access to people who do or um, websites that can be helpful. The problem is that those deafblind grants have not increased. So I'm told uh, in the beginning, the California project as the biggest state in terms of population, I think there were 19 staff members. Today, there are, I think, I think two, one full-time and three part-time because as inflation has gone up and up, everything's got more expensive. The money stays absolutely level. And in the last grant cycle, some states even had their grant reduced a little. So as we found and identified more and more children, um, the pressure on the deafblind projects has increased uh, to a you know, pretty difficult level. And one of the reasons I retired uh, five, six, almost six, six years ago is because I couldn't manage the job anymore. My caseload was so enormous. Uh, it needed somebody younger who could, you know, whiz around more than I was able to. Um, the, the important thing to say historically about this population, children with congenital rubella syndrome, although they were very, there was huge variety, as I said, of ability and disability, the issues were primarily uh, sensory neural hearing loss, cataracts in the eyes, and heart problems. And within, within those three things, there were kind of almost standardized approaches to assessment and education. And Perkins School for the Blind in particular became, as in my experience, the world center of expertise in congenital rubella syndrome, along with Dr. Jan van Dijk in the Netherlands. 
<clears throat> and in the 60s and 70s, Perkins produced masses of fantastic printed information uh, about working with children with rubella syndrome. And a lady called Nan Robbins uh, was a key player. And when I came into the deafblind field in 1983, our library had just about everything that had ever been published in English about rubella syndrome. So I got to know Nan Robbins and uh, I think Carol Cousins and people like that very well. Then the population started to change. And I, I talk often about the changing nature of the population um, and how this has challenged us. And I came into the field in 83. I joined the Deafblind Association in London. And my boss and I set about creating an itinerant early intervention service for families who had young children with deaf blindness. We both came from a generic disability background in early intervention. We work with children with orthopedic disability, sensory impairments, autism, um, you name it, uh, cognitive impairment. So we straight away, when we started taking referrals, we took a wide range of children. And I, this is very personal history. In the first year or two, there were issues with a, a new idea of deaf blindness coming into the old rubella world. First of all, <clears throat> the people who created the Deaf, Blind and Rubella Association in England objected because we were starting to work with children who didn't have rubella syndrome. And I remember some very heated meetings where they felt we should only be working with children with congenital rubella syndrome. Um, it wasn't a good idea to focus only on rubella syndrome because by then the vaccine was taking effect and newborn children with congenital rubella syndrome were largely disappearing in the UK and in other countries like the US where there were government-sponsored national vaccination programs. Um, and we inevitably, I think, we, we won out. Uh, I put wheelchairs because as part of my orientation, I went to visit the one residential establishment in England for adults with deaf blindness. And I noticed that no, nothing was wheelchair accessible. And when I asked about that, they told me that if a person was in a wheelchair, they wouldn't be deaf blind. They would be orthopedically disabled and they would get services for people with orthopedic disability. And I said, but what if they're in a wheelchair and they're deaf blind? And they didn't understand what I meant because they they never dealt with anyone in a wheelchair. And to them, they were two entirely separate worlds. I've put the word seizures because uh, one day uh, in 1984, Princess Diana, who was the Princess of Wales at the time, came to visit our centre. And the, the parent who created the Deaf Blind Association was going to be there with a child to meet Princess Diana. And uh, the child was... Um, we picked the child and the family were going to be there. And when our founder discovered that the little boy had a seizure disorder, she freaked out because she'd never worked with anyone with a seizure disorder. And uh, she absolutely refused to work with the child in case he had a seizure while the Princess of Wales was there. So at the very last minute, I had to, I, I was his key worker. I had to work with him. And I've got a couple of photos of me in my, my blue jeans and my ski sweater meeting the Princess of Wales because I didn't know I was going to be meeting her until the last minute. Then when I visited the adult residential centre, the approach to teaching language was very directive. Um, people were shown photos or given little, little miniature um, plastic miniatures of objects and animals, 
Then they were given the sign, either visually or tactually, but all the tactile input was hand over hand. The staff's hands were very much controlling and directing the residents' hands. And the whole approach was completely directive. And I already by 1983 knew that it shouldn't really be like that. Um, and uh, in the fall, no, two years later, somebody made a training video and they came to video me working in our garden with, with a boy. And they used it to make, to make the point that the directive approach wasn't helpful, but following the child in the Van Dyke sense was the best way to go. And then last, neurological sensory impairment. Back in 1983, um, sensory impairment services often would not work with somebody with, with a diagnosis of cortical visual impairment or neurological um, hearing loss, like auditory neuropathy or uh, central auditory processing disorder. They, deaf services didn't consider those children deaf because they couldn't obtain a, a, an audiogram. You couldn't get a clear idea how deaf they were. And again, we took children into our service on the basis of function, functional uh, diagnosis, functional assessment. And uh, we, right from the beginning, we were working. I remember a girl with uncontrolled seizure disorder. When she was having a bad day with seizures, she went very deaf and very blind. When the seizures were reduced, uh, she could actually see and hear to a certain level. She could speak on those days, but on bad days, she even lost the ability to speak. And um, in her home borough in London, she did, she did have a teacher of the blind, but she couldn't have an itinerant teacher of the deaf because the service didn't consider that she was hearing impaired. Those days are gone, as far as I know, but it was a very different world. And we were moving into unknown territory, which was very exciting, but also very demanding. And it forced us to start sharing and discussing and going for a team approach far more. And this, this awful photograph now is how life begins for, I would say probably for the majority of young children we are working with. No longer are they like um, Laura Bridgman developing perfectly normally for the first two years. They might be like this for the first month, six months, 12 months, two years of their life. So it's a very, very different situation. And the, the population became more and more unique, more and more individual, and more and more complex. And I came into the field in 83. And in 1982 was a big year for deafblind literature, because Jan van Dyck published his book about rubella handicapped children, as they were called then, uh, in the Netherlands, but the book is in English. And in Canada, uh, John McInnes and his wife, Jackie Treffery, published Deafblind Infants and Children, a developmental guide. And those two books uh, were in my backpack as I traveled all over England, um, constant points of reference for me. But also, uh, this is very personal. This is a Dutch book by Mary Rose Jurgens, published actually in 1977, called Confrontation Between the Young Deafblind Child and the Outer World. How to Make the World Surveyable by Organized Structure. And that was probably the most useful book that, that I had in my first five or six years to help me through. Um, and I met Mary Rose Jurgens many years later when I went to the Netherlands. And I was so thrilled and enthusiastic. She was quite scared, I think, because she didn't know what on earth I was so excited about because I actually got to meet her. She was retired by then. Um, and as the population changed, people started to talk about it and write about it. And here I've got um, two, two links at the top. Uh, Marianne Ridjo, 
who was based at Perkins School for the Blind, has been there a long time. She gave a paper at the National Conference on Deaf Blindness um, in 1992 called A Changing Population of Children and Youth with Deaf Blindness, which really struck a chord with me because I'd been saying to people, the population's checked, the kids are getting more complicated, the kids are getting more and more medical issues. And Marianne actually stood up and said this. And it inspired me to do some research on our population. I took a hundred of the children we were working with in 1995, and I researched what anomalies they had, uh, what kind of medical diagnoses they had. And I wrote an article about it in our magazine, Talking Sense, uh, which was called Trends in the Population of Children with Multisensory Impairment. I presented in 95 for the first time at a deafblind international conference in Argentina. And I presented this research. And afterwards I was swamped with people from all over the world in the audience who wanted more information about uh, cortical visual impairment, charge syndrome, seizure disorder, autism, and all the things I was talking about in my presentation. And then at the bottom, I've, I've made a screenshot of an article uh, from 2005, where I and a colleague from the Blind Babies Foundation wrote about these changes and what they meant in terms of professional competence and how we needed to revise the way we were thinking about training for teachers um, of children with deaf blindness. It was such, such a huge step into a different, different world. And a book I would recommend um, is Remarkable Conversations. It was written by two, two experienced teachers from Perkins School for the Blind, Barbara Miles and Mary Ann Ridjo, who I just uh, mentioned. And I would recommend the book it's based largely on case studies, and um, I'm very much a case study person. Um, I think it's probably the best way to convey the, all the important stuff to people. But of course, in this presentation, I'm generalizing and rushing and looking at the clock um, and checking. But we still have 93 people listening, so you're not all running away. Um, remarkable conversations. I would recommend two fantastic webcasts by Jan van Dijk on the Perkins School for the Blind website. Uh, one of them is about child guided assessment. And the other one that I adore is uh, where he talks about the role of the emotional brain. And one of the interesting things as the population have got more complex and more challenging, we focused more and more on the emotional heart of the child. I've done whole day trainings on the emotional heart of the child. And Van Dyck, towards the end of his life, became very, very focused on that aspect of, of the children. Um, NCDB also hosts the National Child Count or the Deafblind Census. And the most up-to-date one is 2018. There were almost 10,000 children. There were many, many etiologies. The biggest in etiology was CHARGE syndrome with almost 1,000 children. But there were many, many other etiologies, as you can see. Uh, so the days when Deaf blindness meant congenital rubella syndrome were long, long gone. And you have to you have to acquire some knowledge and some expertise in many, many different uh, syndromes and chromosome abnormalities. And the vast number of the children had other disabilities alongside uh, vision problems and hearing problems. And I lifted this off NCDB. Uh, two nights ago uh, from the last census. In addition to vision and hearing problems, 64% of the population had cognitive disabilities. 
58% had physical disabilities. 51% had complex healthcare needs. Only 9% had behavioral difficulties, which surprises me. Um, they're not the children I, I've been working with. But 87% um, of the children had one or more additional disabilities. And when it comes to additional disabilities, this is a fabulous article by Robbie Bleha, who's based at the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. She wrote an article, uh, Thoughts on the Assessment of the Student with the Most Profound Disabilities. That is absolutely wonderful. Uh, helped me enormously. I'm, I'm not an academic. I'm very instinctive and very emotional in my approach to the job. I read Robbie's article and it, it clarified what my instincts were telling me to do. It gave me vocabulary to explain things and a structure to explain things. So I would really recommend that you have a look at, at Robbie's article. Charge syndrome. I have learned so much from working with children with charge syndrome that has helped my work with children with other etiologies in the deafblind population. Uh, and I think if you can if you can assess and teach a child with charge syndrome successfully, you'll probably able be able to assess and teach just about um, anyone. And somebody's asking me where um, Robbie's article is located. Uh, if you go to the te TSBVI, the Texas School for the Blind, um, and the, the link is there. But if you go there and click on resources. Um, or search on Robbie Blaher, uh, you will find the article. Um, ch if you're involved with children with CHARGE syndrome, the CHARGE syndrome foundation is the first link. Uh, NCDB, again, has a whole section on CHARGE. My old agency in the UK, which is now called SENSE, has a, a, a really good collection of fact sheets about charge, about 19 fact sheets on different aspects. And the Australian New Zealand charge syndrome page has an online training course now on charge syndrome, which uh, rather like the intervener training program uh, is very comprehensive. Uh, and I would recommend those um, if, if you're interested. So <clears throat> the complexity we've seen growing in the size of the population, multiple etiologies, a wide range of vision and hearing loss, including children, as I've mentioned, whose vision and hearing fluctuates dramatically for a variety of reasons that aren't directly connected to their visual and auditory systems, but other things impinge on the way their eyes and ears are functioning. A whole range of neurological issues, variable functioning, multiple additional anomalies, medical priorities which cut in and take away time and energy from the educational process, many, many specialists needed and involved and difficulties with coordinating but we have to, we have to try and pull all, all of us together. And then, as I've already stressed, and I keep saying this, a great scarcity of professionals skilled in um, assessment and, and teaching. So it's, uh, it's difficult. And Jan van Dyck wrote this uh, a long time ago. He said, the multisensory impaired person uh, is a unique human being with a unique line of development, who is more dependent on the professional's willingness to accept this and act accordingly than any other group of disabled persons. And what he's saying is, we need to both accept and change our behavior to fit in with them and their way of being. And I, I don't think this is uh, surprising news anymore, but 20 years ago when he wrote this, he was still trying to convince people that this is what they, they needed um, to do. Um, 
So if, if the population is so big and so diverse, and if each child is unique and different, why are we promoting deafblind education as a label to cover all these children who in many ways don't fit together at all? And uh, Barbara Miles and Marianne Ridjo, in the introduction to their book, uh, Remarkable Conversations, give us a, a very nice um, justification. And I've, I've made some bullet points. First of all, if we say deaf blindness as a label and we apply it to these very, very different children, first of all, it reminds people there's a central educational priority which is the development of communication. And that needs to get across to people. Secondly, it reminds people there's a need for specific but scarce educational expertise from people familiar with deaf blindness. And that doesn't necessarily mean a teacher of the visually impaired or a teacher uh, of the deaf. <clears throat> Thirdly, the label deafblind highlights the child's sensory impairments as being of primary importance. And that is a battle that we, we have to keep fighting and that I'm still fighting in my retirement when families help ask me to help and input with their child's team. It, it reminds people that even if the child has a diagnosis of autism, even if they have significant orthopedic disabilities, they are deaf blind and we need to deal with that. And you can't say, as has been said with, to me, with this level of cognitive impairment, we don't think vision training or glasses or hearing aids would be helpful. And nobody is in a position to say that from a basis of knowledge and fact. So whatever the child is like, their vision and hearing loss needs to be addressed, whoever they are. Because the word deafblind draws attention to the child's difficulty with receiving information input with the consequent risks of isolation, not just social isolation, but from the world. Deaf blindness clearly states that there is a need for individual instruction because the child is not able to function effectively, certainly not all the time, in a group and at a distance. It tells people that the student is going to rely on interpreters to connect them to the world. That doesn't just mean interpreters in the traditional sense who can sign with them or fingerspell with them. It means interpreters in every sense who can introduce the world to them in a way that's accessible to the child and meaningful. And it also means that this child has had a limited number and variety of experiences, and that will continue to be the case unless we can find a way to override that situation. And as Donna says, uh, in the child's IEP, it's important to check deaf blind. Um, too often, deaf blind is not checked because the child seems to be very delayed in their development. And people automatically think that the correct label is just multiple disabilities or cognitive impairments or orthopedic disability. The child might have all those. But deafblind is the key to getting their education appropriate. If you don't bother with the deafblind side, nothing else you do is really going to get through to the child and work. So that's a fight that I think is always going to go on. And as Lisa says, this can be very difficult when the team only wants to put multiple disabilities down. And it is indeed very frustrating. And it's like um, Groundhog Day. You just have to keep going, keep going keep going. Now, uh, assessment, a little bit about assessment. This is a document. Um, it's quite old now. Um, but Charity Rowland, who many of you will be familiar with, she got a grant to do a research project. 
uh, a long time ago. And she's published it as a, a booklet, um, and it's really useful. It sh After a survey, uh, she came up with the 12 most popular assessment tools that people use with students labeled deafblind. Um, it's obviously a very wide uh, uh, selection of assessment tools. Not all of them were designed for children with deaf blindness. And uh, the, the booklet she, she published details each assessment approach, says who designed it and who was it designed for, and then says what's good about it with students with deaf blindness and what are the limitations with students with deaf blindness. And in the introduction, to the booklet, uh, they give some little guidelines, which I really like. Very, very short, like three quarters of a page. Guidelines for parents approaching an assessment, guidelines for teachers, guidelines for social workers, and guidelines for psychologists. So I would recommend you look for this, maybe download it, um, and uh, give it to other people as well. <clears throat> and then um, uh, two articles, one by me, what does follow the child mean? And one by my colleague, Julie Meyer, called capacity or deficit. The lens we use to view students does make a difference. And Julie and I have done a number of presentations and trainings together where we're pushing functional ob observational assessment as the as the key forwards. So again, I would recommend you, you look uh, for those articles. Everything that children with deaf blind, I'm sorry, I know I'm jumping a bit. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if I should go, ta-da, when, when I'm about to be a big leap. I'm still talking about assessment. But it's good to know that um, everything the child does, unless they've got involuntary movements, which are not that common in my experience, everything they do has meaning to them, not to us. That's the problem. Uh, but I think if we don't understand what they're doing and why, the obligation on us is to try and work out the meaning or at least come up with a good guess and test it uh, and see what we think. And I see the link. Somebody uh, says the link. Um, if the link to Charity Roland uh, isn't working, um, maybe you can do a search on Charity Roland and it will probably come up there. She's published a number of things, but this sh should come up. Or you could search Charity Roland assessing communication. Uh, and see if that works. I'm sorry if the if the link doesn't work. Um, so um, trying to assess the meaning of what the child uh, is is doing. And I think um, I've talked about this. I think the last time I did one of these webinars for you, um, most people focus on the child's disabilities, but close attention to their abilities especially to the things that they do can reveal more about the difficulties they face and the strategies they are using to function effectively. So what does that mean? What it means is if you're in a situation and the child say on the floor and she's rocking side to side and she's holding her fingers up and twiddling her fingers and looking at them and she's, she's uh, smacking her lips or she's blowing raspberries rhythmically and you say to someone who could be a family member or a, a professional what kind of things does this girl like it's not unusual in my experience for people to look a bit puzzled and then to they often laugh and they say oh she doesn't really like anything and then I say, oh, do you think she likes rocking side to side? Oh, she, do, she does that a lot. Yeah. Well, do you think she likes it? Well, probably. Do you think she likes wiggling her fingers? And, and then I, I share with the person 
the things the child is doing, which presumably she likes or she needs, because that's the point of the assessment. That's what we're trying to identify and then interpret and then utilize in our teaching. When people say she doesn't like anything really, what they usually mean is she doesn't like anything I've tried to do with her. She doesn't like anything that's a part of the current curriculum. She doesn't like anything that we present to her when we put her in a chair sitting at a table. That's obviously an entirely different thing to saying the child doesn't like anything. And that mindset is surprisingly common. And the things the child is doing are so undervalued that people don't even see them. They think the child's doing nothing. And I'm looking and I'm making, literally making notes on my pad. And I'm scribbling all the things the child is doing that are helping me understand who she is, what's working, what's she into, and why do I think she might be doing that? Um, and, and we have to help people see that is a very effective way of working. And my, my assessment questions to the child are, I always begin with, how do you feel? What do you like? What do you want? What do you do? And that last one, what do you do, might be the most important of all those assessment questions. You are giving me the gift of showing me what you can do, what you like, what you need. And that's what I want to know. At some point, I'm a teacher. I'm going to say, what can you do? And I will start to intervene to try and uh, provoke the child into responses to see how far I can stretch them in demonstrating their skills <laughs> or their cooperation. Um, and uh, I think what can you do is very much a teacher question. And all too often, that's where people start when they're assessing a child. But what can you do uh, gets what do you do gets you a long way before you need to start playing and experimenting and testing to see what they can do. Um, I would refer you to this book by Jan van Dijk, published by the American Printing House for the Blind, uh, Child Guided Strategies, the Van Dyck Approach to Assessment. Um, I'll, I'll move on, but if you if you search for Van Dyke and publications, uh, you'll find it. And back to deafblind education, far from being exclusive, separate, and different from mainstream education, and I mean good quality mainstream education, good quality deafblind educational practice in assessment, instruction and program evaluation offers significant benefits to all students and to all educators. And believe me, if every infant who's born in the world had a good deafblind specialist teacher from birth, they would benefit enormously. This is not something weird or exclusive. It's actually very inclusive because it's individualized and because the goals are inclusion, ultimately, however long term those goals will be. Um, I always hesitate about showing the next few slides because they're based on a chapter in this book. It's about charge syndrome and it's a German book, but it's written in English. All the articles are written in English, either written in English or translated into English. And um, the head of the deafblind program at Perkins School for the Blind, Martha Majors, has written a chapter in the book that to me is probably the best concise view of deafblind education. She's writing about charge, but really she's writing about good quality deafblind education. And I've, I've picked out some, some points in the next three slides. First of all, the educational priorities, very different to an academic curriculum. 
uh, uh, straight away this will strike you. There's not much here about math or literacy um, in, a, in a more conventional sense, though number and literacy are embedded in all these things. Develop skills to become an effective communicator. Learn how to make choices. Learn appropriate social skills. So you see, each one of these, again, is a huge topic. And you could work on each of these priorities throughout the child's entire school career. You probably should work on them throughout their school career. But it's, it's good to be reminded there's a lot to do with these students. Learn how to be part of social and learning groups within their potential ability. Develop the skill of negotiation. Learn how to take turns. Develop organizational skills in all environments. Develop strategies for coping with challenges such as anxiety and obsessive compulsive routines. And we know that anxiety and deaf blindness go together uh, with remarkable consistency and develop the ability to anticipate activities and wait for them appropriately. And here, I think a lot of, a lot of these priorities relate to the emotional heart of the child. You get that feeling. Um, it's not focused very exclusively on academics, though academics are there. I'm not saying forget academics. In fact, you can use academics to work on these priorities um, quite well. Uh, but this should be at the front of your mind as where you're going and why you're doing things. Then she talks about teaching strategies. And again, um, these are not necessarily what you would find in regular educational um, documentation. Making choices, providing a clear sequence to activities using the principle of partial participation. So doing with, not for, and allowing the child to be involved or even independent as long as they have that ability before you take over. Uh, motivation, the child's motivators. And motivators are uniquely individual. Uh, I, I wrote an article about motivators years ago uh, to make the point that the motivators come from the child and you can't predict in advance. And I gave them to a, a, a school and I went in to visit the school a month later and the teacher told me how much she loved the article, but it would have been much more helpful if I'd put a list of good motivators in the article. And she totally missed my point that you can't give someone a list. These are good motivators for that child you're working with who I don't know, because it just doesn't, it can't work like, like that. And what the child does starts you on the road of working out what are their motivators. Follow the student's lead, respect and use the student's preferences, model, behaviors, negotiation and empowerment, using appropriate prompts, using appropriate pause time, use traditional task analysis, practice sharing and turn taking, express clear expectations in the activities and provide access to appropriate communication modes. And then um, the environment. And we, we do a lot of work on uh, optimizing the learning environment for the child, providing a consistent place for their calendar or schedule. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Providing a safe space for relaxation um, and sensory reorganization. Uh, making sure that distractions in the work area are reduced as much as possible. Uh, auditory, visual and tactile. Uh, and smell uh, distractions as well. Possibly introducing adapted furniture and lighting. Uh, thinking about all the more traditional visual accommodations and auditory accommodations. Alternating active and passive sessions in the day. 
alternating preferred and less preferred activities so that the child isn't just being ground down with learning, 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 but can be motivated and engaged at least some of the time. Monitoring fatigue issues carefully. If you know the child, you know when to stop, when to rest, when to change activity. And you know it before there's a meltdown or, or complete opting out. Consistency in the environment and the schedule, but also working on the child's ability to be flexible when they need to. Thinking about the physical environment, plan to support the child's attention and the staff to be tuned in um, to, to the child's behaviour. And now I see I have 20 minutes left and about 30 slides. So I'm going to jump through. Um, and uh, in, in the Charge Syndrome Foundation website, uh, there is an article by Martha Majors and her colleague, Sharon Steltzer. Um, and, oh, uh, Donna's just mentioned environmental design for success. Uh, yes, and that's a good way of putting it uh, in a nutshell. Um, and in their article, uh, Martha and Sharon um, identify the educational approach in terms of thinking about communication, the impact of sensory losses, the design of the curriculum, the, what you do to modify the environments and the teaching strategies. Um, language and communication issues that you, you, really, you probably in the beginning should use multimodal uh, inputs until you know what works for the child. Um, it's good to include concrete modes, something like uh, picture cards or uh, tactile objects or braille or tactile symbols. Even if you are using sign, visual sign or tactile sign or spoken language, uh, you can introduce other supports like the calendar system, word cards, a vocabulary book, in some form and the way you structure routines. And the goal is to discover the child's preferred modes. And it wouldn't be unusual for those modes to change depending on the child's health and their level of energy and alertness and whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable, whether they're in pain or not, whether they're hungry or not, um, and those kinds of things. And it wouldn't be unusual for a child to like to receive language through speech. Maybe they've got an implant or, or um, hearing aids. I couldn't think what they were called, hearing aids. But they might sign back. And they're not being stubborn. They're not being difficult. People forget that speech isn't only about hearing. We don't speak with our ears. And if the ears and the brain are picking up spoken language and understanding it, that doesn't mean you can therefore speak that language. Um, there's an awful lot involved in, in uh, speech production that might be getting in the way and it's quicker for the child to use sign. Um, and using mix and varying modes is, is part of the pattern. And I wrote in an article um, some time ago, many children, if they have a range of communication options available to them, both receptively and expressively, clearly show their skill at choosing what suits them best from moment to moment. And this, I think this is one of the reasons deafblind education frightens people away, because you need a lot of confidence and you need a lot of skill and you need to be absolutely wide awake and alert to follow the child through these things and acknowledge them and honor them by giving them these options, giving them this power, if you like. And um, it, it's complicated. And it's easy for me to, to say these things because I've been doing this for 37 years. So we need to be very supportive if people look a bit resistant or a bit scared because it can be done and it needs to be done. It's important to explain to people out in the real world, not the deaf blind world, that they shouldn't work at the limits of the child's vision and hearing abilities. 
I've often seen people, they get an audiogram or they get advice from a vision teacher. And amongst other things, it tells them, you know, at like at what decibel level are they hearing intelligible speech? And people then assume that they will always be hearing and understanding at that level. But in fact, it needs to be boosted to make it easier for them. And equally, if it gives some information about the like the smallest size of font that the child can see and identify, they often get given everything in that size of font. And none of us reads with the smallest possible font that we can just manage to read. Equally, we don't put the radio on, so it's just loud enough for us to hear if we really concentrate hard. We always go way above our uh, visual and hearing thresholds. And we need to explain that as a fundamental of good deafblind educational practice. Um, I, I could do a whole day on social considerations, but I've seen buddy systems and circle of friends used very effectively with children with deaf blindness, very effectively. And Tim Hartshorn, who's presenting to you in at the end of the week, um, he has a son who's deaf blind, who's now an adult. They use circle of friends very powerfully um, throughout his, his uh, education and have presented to it and have brought his entire circle of friends to national conferences to be on the platform and to present with them. And it's a nice example of how in the deafblind field, we have to be eclectic. Um, one thing about deafblind education is it's entirely promiscuous. It will bring in ideas from autism, cognitive disability, orthopedic disabilities, from the physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy worlds. Anything that looks useful and that will help is okay to bring in. Well, okay, buddy systems and circle of friends weren't devised specifically for children with deaf blindness, but with the deaf blind adaptations, they can be very helpful. I've already mentioned open hands, open access. Um, but this is a link to it. It's on the NCDB website. You do have to register with it and get a username and a password, um, uh, but it's free. And there are masses of modules. Um, so many of us in the deafblind field were roped in to work on presenting these. I did mine with Tim Hartson and a couple of other people on environmental adaptations. And I'm just going to share a little bit about our module, uh, managing the environment to modify behavior. Um, we know that external factors in the environment can have a profound impact on a child's behavior. Uh, and one way we can modify what the child is doing is to change features of the environment. Um, I I'll skip that. And my old professor in England, Tony Best, wrote an article on structuring the environment a long time ago. Um, he talks about the three key elements in the environment, people, time, and space. And he also talks from a, <clears throat> a Norwegian teacher called Anna Nafstad, uh, who did a lot of work on the environmental zones for the child, face space, body space, personal space, and social space, starting up close and then extending out over, over time. And I'll say a little bit about Tony's three key elements, just a, a little tiny bit. Um, people, and in the deafblind field, certainly at the beginning. Um, oh, and Julie, my colleague Julie is reminding me that the uh, the OHOA intervener modules uh, now have a web-based version, which I didn't know. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, that people should be, at, certainly at the beginning, limited in number. They need to be available. They need to be responsive to the child. So they shouldn't be overburdened with non-child tasks because they are there 
for the child, only for the child. They need to be engaged. They need to develop very skilled uh, observation. They need to be familiar with the child and to the child. They need to be identifiable by the child and they need to be consistent. Now, again, like so many of the lists I've shown you, this is a, you know, a 12 month work plan um, in an educational environment, uh, but important. Uh, I've mentioned the large multidisciplinary team, and I'm going to talk about uh, another colleague who uh, is a psychology doctoral student in Michigan, Lily Slavin. This is Lily. Um, she created a checklist of educational needs for individuals with charge syndrome, and it's big and it's very impressive, but it's a fantastic reminder of who needs to be involved with the child with charge syndrome, with deaf blindness. And um, I put a picture of Lily because uh, a screenshot of the front page didn't look very impressive because it's all words. Um, so that's all I'll say about people, but you can, you can explore and discover that. Tony's next uh, area of the three was time. We need to think about sequencing and we need to plan sequences to fit the individual child. We need to think about consistency of sequences. We need to think about number and working on number. And incidentally, with young children with deaf blindness, I use movement a lot to introduce math. Bouncing the child, I mean, you, you go with the child, but I can imagine maybe bouncing a child on a therapy ball or rolling them on a therapy ball, bouncing them twice, boom, boom, and then blowing in their face and they laugh. And you bounce them twice and they laugh. And then you bounce them once and stop. And you see if they understand the number that you're working on. And I've, I've worked up to number four and five uh, in terms of movement, see, repeating movement patterns with children. So there are all sorts of ways to introduce math. Um, it isn't just about sitting at a table. Calendars and schedules, um, surveying the past and anticipating the future. Think about repetitions with concrete markers and adapted timepieces to count time down. So the time as an awareness of time passing. Uh, the concrete markers, I used to do circuit work with children where we'd set up a circuit for them. And each time we completed a circuit, there might be a little plastic uh, bracelet that they could put over a post. And when the last bracelet comes off and goes on, they know they've, they've finished the circuit, those kinds of things. I've mentioned calendar systems a lot. Um, this is a book by Robbie Blayhar who I've already mentioned in Texas. Uh, there's also a nice article on the Texas School for the Blind website by Robbie, uh, but the book is really quite comprehensive. And here are a couple of photos. Here are very simple calendars. The first picture on the left shows an object in a white bowl and the yellow basket is the finished basket. So you go to the white bowl, you see what's coming next, you do the activity and then you bring that object back and you put it in the finished box. You're starting to get the child used to the idea of a calendar. And then on the right, you see a slightly more complicated calendar where you've got three different objects in a sequence representing three different activity. Oh, and Chris Montgomery's recognizing the pictures. Yeah, old pictures, uh, old but good. Um, here are more advanced examples. And on the right, you can see a very, very advanced example, which actually shows two weeks. And I've seen children in, at the Deaf Blind Institute in the Netherlands. I saw a boy who had the whole semester on, I think, nine little shelves, like a bookcase. And each one had a tray he could pull out. And each tray represented a week. Uh, and and uh, it, it was it was interesting. Individual workstation 
Um, this depends on lots of things. But I've just as an example, I, I went into a, a class of young children. It was a kindergarten class. They were having a lot of issues with a little girl um, with deaf blindness. And I realized very quickly that there were little round tables with, I think, three children on each table. And the teacher, there was a walkway through the tables, wending through the tables. And they'd sat the girl with her back to the walkway. And every time she was trying to work, every time somebody went by, they brushed her back or her hair. And she was getting more and more irate. And I suggested they move her to the other side of the table with her back to the wall. And she was a different child. And they thought I was a genius. I remember it so well. It was up in North San Francisco Bay. Um, and I took, you know, I took the assumption of my genius in my stride. But really, sometimes uh, you can create physical environments that really, really help the child to attend uh, and to settle. And a big part of that is physical positioning. And I talk about this a lot. And um, uh, it might mean adaptive chairs and adapted tables. Sometimes it can mean standing. Some children, I know it's counterintuitive, but some children work better when they're standing. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying they should be on a rocker board like the kids on the right, but maybe they should. You know, We're talking about individualizing not going by our gut feeling of what's going to be right and what won't be right. There's a place for intuition and gut feeling, but ultimately the child has to give us the okay. Um, sometimes the children need to be in pretty unusual positions to use their vision and hearing or to, to, to use visually directed reach. Um, and sometimes a simple angled desktop can produce... Um, calmer behavior, more cooperative behavior, longer attention span in terms of time. Um, health issues. Uh, there are complex health issues. Sometimes school placement depends on the availability of medical or paramedical services. The child might go to school with a full-time nurse, um, depending on who they are. Uh, it can be difficult to balance health and educational needs, but sometimes you can make healthcare educational. Think of the early vocabulary. The child needs vocabulary to describe uh, having oxygen or suction um, or uh, a tube feed or tube, tube change. And sometimes from an early age, you can introduce a child to tube feeding. So you're doing with, not for. And as they get older, some children at a surprisingly early age can take over more and more. And here are two kids I know. They're at a family picnic. The boy on the right has been uh, organizing his own tube feed with support from his family and his classroom staff for some time. The girl on the right is tube fed, but has never seen anyone this actively involved. It's always been done for her. And you can tell by her face, she insisted on holding the, the feed herself and she couldn't be more thrilled. And her mom said to me, this was a huge day for her because it, it, it moved her on into realizing and, and the family realizing that she could be engaged in these things. Um, and I've got ooh, two minutes. Um, a safe place for rest and reorganization of the body. And, um, you know, that could, I've got some nice charge pictures of children uh, resting and reorganizing their bodies. Uh, they don't do it in the way I do it. I have to say, <laughs> this is a kid I met two years ago in the Netherlands. You know, the idea that this is how you relax and rest is interesting. And um, I, my last section was going to be about self-regulation issues, but I've presented on that before. So I'm going to stop with two minutes to go. And um, thank you for listening. 
and I hope I've managed the chat box reasonably well. I hope I've provoked you into following up on some of the things I've presented, because really I'm just trying to show you perhaps a wider range of options and point you in other directions. But do not let anyone tell you that deafblind education is, is strange or very specialized. It's just common sense, but common sense taken to the nth degree. And no child is too something to benefit from deafblind education. In fact, you need deafblind education because they might be too disabled, too distracted, too anxious to benefit from more um, traditional uh, approaches. So push it, you know, deaf blind education. It's a fantastic discipline and, uh, and we need to be very proud of it. And I, I'm lucky I came to the US 10 year, 20 years ago because of disputes with my managers in London. And I only came for two years and I'm very lucky that I was allowed to stay. And I've come into the most wonderful group of people imaginable. And some of them are, are watching today. I mean, the organizers today, uh, the people at um, Perkins School for the Blind, who I've, I've been mentioning and quoting, uh, people like uh, Chris in Texas, uh, my colleague, Julie Meyer, um, Minnie Lambert, who's only a parent, but is as powerful an advocate for deafblind education as you will ever, ever find. So um, uh, my last two words are always good luck because you need that as well. Thank you.